show we've been looking back on the story of the campaign to save the bowstring bridge and i'm still getting text messages about that right now well the protesters have reached the end of the road now the demolitions have gone past the point of no return and the listing appeal has also failed and as we heard before it's been a long hard fought battle on both sides of uh, the bowstring bridge here's a bit of a look back uh, at how it all spanned out bbc radio leicester fact file fact file so where did the beginning of the end begin for the blighted bowstring bridge? Well, if you ask the city council, it was way back in 2005 when its ruling Labour group agreed to bring down the DCU's bridge to make way for a brand new sports centre, housing a public swimming pool to replace the one which the city council itself had pulled down some 10 years ago. But the structure's fate was finally sealed in August of this year, when city councillors, meeting behind closed doors, agreed to press ahead with dismantling it once and for all. That decision immediately sparked an outcry among the legion of protesters desperate to see the bowstring saved and preserved. They would tried to get it listed but were turned down by English Heritage on the grounds that it wasn't special enough. Bridge devotees disagreed and as the bulldozers prepared to move in, they battled to gather what they considered to be fresh, compelling evidence to show the old Iron Lady spanning Western Boulevard was a one-off, a thing of beauty, a national treasure and in urgent need of nurturing to bring back to her former glory. Petitions were started, protests were staged, angry messages were posted on various social network websites. By the end of this summer, feelings were running high. But the city council would not be moved. It claimed the bridge had to come down if the people of Leicester wanted their long-awaited public pool. The Moffat University, which will eventually build that new pool, also found itself increasingly coming in for criticism from those who considered it equally culpable for the bowstring's threatened demise. Interviewed on BBC Radio Leicester, the university spokesman David Alter indicated back in September that it may be prepared to meet with protesters to hear their case. But he also made clear that what happened to the bridge was the council's decision, not the university's. So the row rumbled on, becoming increasingly acrimonious, with both sides accusing the other of failing to see the bigger picture. Then in December, the city council finally announced what many had been fearing. It would forge ahead with bringing down the bridge, and it named a subcontractor hired at a cost of around half a million pounds to do the deed. It also stepped in to step up security at the site, with the aim of thwarting any further attempts by demonstrators to gain access onto the site to hang banners and posters. The City Council branded such acts vandalism. The protesters called it a desperate bid to get their voices heard by a council they claimed was closed-minded and deaf to the wishes of the people they're elected to serve. October arrived and the deadlock continued. So the protesters stepped up their fight, taking to direct action. And BBC Radio Leicester was there, on the spot, as the wrecking crew moved in to be met by a small but determined army of demonstrators wanting to block the knockdown. Soon, as word spread, more gathered, some coming from as far away as Lincoln and London. They were united in their criticism of any attempt to do away with what they considered a key part of Leicester's railway past. But as the days went by and the bridge disappeared piece by piece, the numbers of angry protesters dwindled as it became clear little more could be done and the war was not going to be won. But then a glimmer of hope. Hardliners had found fresh evidence about the architectural and historical significance of the bowstring which they claimed had been overlooked by previous attempts to get it formally protected and they made an urgent appeal to the Department of Culture, Media and Sport and English Heritage to consider their case and make a decision before it was too late. Yesterday, that decision finally came through. It was an apologetic no. Ironically, that final blow was delivered as the final blow also came down on the bridge itself. Yesterday lunchtime, the top section of the bowstring was finally severed in two. The rest, as they say, is history.